So with this lecture, we start an entirely new uh, subject, conditional expectation. So let me start with some definitions. We will be working in a probability space, omega, so a set omega, a sigma algebra f, and a probability p defined on this sigma algebra. And I will fix an element a in f. I will assume that the probability of a is strictly positive, and I will define the conditional probability given A. So the conditional probability given A. And this is, if you take another element B in F, I will represent that by the probability of B given A. And by definition, this is the probability of the intersection B intersection A divided by P of A. So this is the definition. And I assumed that the probability is strictly positive, so to be able to divide by P of A. And actually, this definition provides a new probability in this uh, measure space. So if I take omega and F, I can define now a new probability, which I will represent by P A, whose value of a set B is given by this formula. So this is the probability of B given A. And I leave you as an exercise to prove that P A is a probability measure on this space. So this is a probability measure. And that P A of A is equal to 1. So this is uh, the definition of conditional probability. So in the previous take, I defined the conditional probability of B given A, and I defined the probability P of A. Now I want to define the uh, conditional expectation. So we will always be working with this probability space, so I will uh, erase that in a second. And well, once you have uh, defined the probability, you can define the expectation associated to that probability. So let me take f, a function which is defined on omega and take values on r. Let's assume that this function is measurable and integrable with respect to p. So this means that the integral of the absolute value of f dp is finite. And now I will define the conditional expectation of f given a, which is also represented sometimes by the expectation with respect to the measure P A of F. And that, by definition, will be the expectation of F with respect to the measure P of A. And this is equal to F dP, so the original expectation, divided by the probability. Um, and on the set A, so let me represent that by chi A dP, and that divided by P of A. And I will sometimes represent this expectation, so remember this is the indicator function of the set A, which is one on the set A and zero outside of it, and this is also represented by the integral over the set A of, DF, of F dP divided by of A. So this is um, the definition of the conditional expectation of an integrable function f given a set A, which I'm assuming has a positive probability. So note that this is well defined because I'm assuming f to be integrable, therefore that this function is also integrable and this integral is well defined, and p of A, I, well dividing by p of A it's allowed because I'm assuming that p of A is strictly positive. So this is uh, the definition of a conditional expectation given set A, which, is, uh, which has a positive measure. So just a remark before I give you an example. If now I consider the function f to be the indicator of a set B, so take a set B which is measurable and take the indicator of this set B. If now I compute the conditional expectation of 
the indicator of B given A. Note that uh, the indicator of the set B is uh, integrable. Well, so this is, by definition, the integral over A of chi B dP divided by the probability of A. So uh, here we are int integrating a set which is one in the intersection of A and B and zero outside. So this is the probability of A intersection B divided by the probability of A. And this is exactly the probability of B given A. This is the definition of this probability, which I gave you a few minutes ago. So what we have is that the expect conditional expectation of the indicator of B given A, it's exactly the probability of B given A as with usual measures. Now, let me give you an example to fix these ideas. Uh, let's assume that we have a deck, a pack of uh, 52 cards. And you consider all uh, possible ways in which uh, you can observe these cards. So they are in the total 52 factorial ways in which uh, you can distribute these uh, 52 cards. Now, let me define two events. So I will first draw a card. A1 will be that the first card is a spade. And A2 will be that the second card is a spade. So what is uh, the probability of A1? Well, we have these 52 cards. I want that in the first observation I have a spade. So there are 13 possible ways in which I observe a spade. And now, um, for the second card, well, I already removed from the deck one card. So I have 51 uh, cards remaining. There is no restriction, so I have 51 ways in which to draw the second card up to the last one in which I will have only one way. So this is the total number of ways in which I can distribute this deck of cards and obtain in the first observation a spade. So the probability of A1 will be um, this product, 13 times 51 times 50 times 1, divided by the total number of possible ways in which I can distribute these cards, which is 52 factorial. So this probability, it's 13 times 51 factorial divided by 52 factorial. And from that, we get that this is 13 divided by 52, which is 1 fourth um, as you expected. Now, I can also, well, for the same reasons, the probability of A2, it's also equal to 1 fourth. And I can compute the probability of A1 intersection A2. And now um, I want the first card to be a spade and the second card to be a spade. So in my first pick, I'll have 13 possibilities. In the second pick, well, I have only uh, 12 spades remaining. So I have 12 uh, ways in which I can get a spade. And after that, well, I have 50 cards remaining and I have no restriction, so I have 50 ways in doing that until the last pick, which is 1. So uh, the probability of this intersection will be 13 times 12 times 50 factorial divided by 52 uh, factorial, and this is uh, 1 fourth times so here I have 52 times 51. 13 divided by 52, we've seen it's 1 fourth, and remains 12 over 51. So this is uh, the probability of the intersection. Okay. Now, I could be interested in what is the probability that in my second pick, I get a spade, given that in the first pick, I had a spade. So this is the, what is the probability of a2 given A1, the probability of A1, it's uh, positive, so I'm allowed to uh, compute this probability. By definition, this is the probability 
of A1 intersection A2 divided by the probability of A1. But uh, I can, and this allows me to compute this conditional probability. But what I could do in this formula is to actually, this formula allows me to write that the probability of A1 intersection A2 it's equal to the probability of A1 times the probability of A2 given A1. And this gives me an alternative, and in many times, as in this one, simpler way in computing the uh, probability of an intersection of two events. Why? Well, because you know that uh, the probability of A1, it's very easy to compute. We have seen it, it's one fourth. And now, if I know that in the first peak I had a spade, I ask myself what is the probability to get in the second peak a spade. This means that in the first peak I had a spade. So in the 51 remaining, um, in my deck of 51 cards, what I have is that I have 12 spades and, well, 13 of each of the other uh, possibilities. So this means that if I want to get a spade in my second draw, I have to pick one of these 12, and I have no restrictions for the next ones, so I, this is 12 times 50 times 1. So this is the number of possibilities in which I get a spade in my first pick, and I have to divide that by 51 factorial, which is the total number, because remember now I have a deck of 51 cards, and this is equal to uh, 12 divided by 51. So this is 12 divided by 51, and again, I get that the probability of A1 intersection A2, it's one fourth multiplying 12 by 51, which is what I obtained by a direct computation, but now, um, well, in this way, it's much simpler to compute uh, the probability of this intersection. So this is, um, well, one formula which will be used many times um, in the exercise or in the next lecture or in the future. So remember, I will always be working with this probability space, and I will not mention that again. So now I will assume that I have a countable partition of my set omega. So I have a countable number of sets An, and I'm assuming that these An's form a partition of omega. This means that, well, I want them to be measurable. Then I want them to make a partition. This means that omega will be equal to the union of the Aj, and that Ai intersection Aj will be the empty set for i different from j. And I will also require that uh, all elements of this partition have a strictly positive probability so that I can take um, conditional probabilities with respect to uh, these sets. So I'm assuming that the probability of AJ is strictly positive for all J. So now, uh, let's assume that uh, we are in such a case. And let me consider an element B of my sigma algebra and I want to compute the probability of this element B. Well, since omega can be written as this union, this probability is certainly equal to the intersection of B with respect to omega, and this probability, since omega is equal to that union, it's the union of J larger than one of B intersection AJ. And this is equal because the aj are uh, the joint two by two. This is equal to the sum for j larger than one of the probability of b intersection aj. And we have seen that this probability, it's equal to the probability of aj times the probability of b given aj times the probability of Aj. So I have here a formula uh, for the probability of B 
in terms of the conditional probabilities. And, well, I will use this formula in order to build a conditional expectations. Well, in the same way, if I have a function f, which is from omega to r, which is uh, integrable and measurable with respect to f, I can write the integral of f with respect to dp as f times the indicator function of the set omega, but the set omega is the union of the aj. And, well, since the aj or the joint, this is equal to the sum of f times chi aj. So remember, this is the indicator function. Now, uh, since f is integrable, I can use the dominated convergence theorem to exchange the integral with the sum. So this is the sum of f chi aj. Now, if you remember the definition of the integral given uh, set aj, so this is equal to um, the integral of f with respect to the measure p aj and times the probability of the set aj. So this is um, the conditional expectation of f given aj. So here again, we have a formula for the integral of a function f in terms of the conditional expectations times the probability. So uh, this extends that uh, equation that we just derived to integrals. So if we replace here f by an indicator of set p, we get exactly that formula over there. Now, um, given this partition of my set omega, let me define a sigma algebra G as the smallest sigma algebra which contains all these sets, AJ. So this is um, a sigma algebra, and it's the smallest sigma algebra which contains all these sets. This is the definition of the sigma algebra G. And uh, what I claim, and I leave you as an exercise, is that, well, a set B belongs to um, this sigma algebra G if and only if there exists a subset M of N, so a subset of um, the integers, the non-negative, the positive integers, such that B is equal to the union for G in M of the set AJ. So all elements of this sigma algebra G are of countable unions of these sets, or uh, unions, of course it's countable because on the old set it's countable, so it's a union of the sets AJ. And what I, I claim, and I will prove, is the following. Well, here I have a characterization of the elements of G. Now I want a characterization of the functions which are uh, G measurable. So let me take function H from omega to R, and I claim that A is G measurable if and only if H is constant on each set AJ. So I'll prove that. And so again, what I'm claiming is that a function H is measurable with respect to this sigma algebra if and only if it's constant on each set AJ. So uh, let me prove one direction. First, so I am assuming that H is constant on each set AJ. And uh, let me call A HJ the value, so this is equal to H of omega for omega in AJ. So H is constant, let me call the constant value of H on the set AJ, let me represent it by HJ. Now I want to show that um, H is G measurable, 
So what I need to prove is that if I take the inverse image of any Borel set B, this belongs to G. So I take any Borel set B. So remember, B represents the sigma algebra of Borel sets of R. And well, maybe it's unfortunate that I'm using the same notation for uh, elements of G and elements of B, but I think it's clear. So I fix what I have to show is that if I take any Borel set B, the inverse image of B by H belongs to uh, G. Fine, but what is uh, this set? So H minus one of B is the set of omegas in omega such that H of omega belongs to this set B. Now, uh, let me call M the all G larger than one, such that H of G belongs to um, B. So H J is the value of H on the set A J. So now I'm taking uh, the set of indices for which A J is in B, this borrowed set. And well, it's these are uh, the only possible values, H, J are all values of H. And uh, omega belongs to, H of omega belongs to B. So what I claim is that this set, it's exactly the union for J in M of A, J. It's defined as this. So uh, in order to prove this identity, let me first show that uh, this set is included. To prove that, I have to show that AJ is included in this set. But so fix J in M, let's consider AJ. Well, AJ um, is the value of H at is this all the omegas for which, um, so let me take omega in AJ. And I want to prove that uh, omega is in this set. So in order to prove that omega is this set, I have to show that H of omega belongs to B, but H of omega, it's HJ, and H, since J is in M, HJ is in B, and therefore uh, H of omega, it's indeed in B. Right, so let me repeat. Uh, in order to prove this inclusion, I have to fix an element omega in here in this set and prove that it belongs to the other set. So let's fix omega in this set. This means that omega belongs to some aj for some j in m. Since omega belongs to aj, h of omega, it's hj. Since j belongs to m, hj belongs to b. This tells me that h of omega belongs to b, and therefore that omega belongs to the inverse image of B. So that proves this inclusion. So now let's see uh, the other inclusion. I want to prove uh, that this set is included in that. So let me take uh, a set omega such that H of omega is in B. If H of omega is in B, well, H of omega takes it's equal to H of k, uh, if so, H of omega takes uh, is a certain value because this is uh, enumeration. So let's assume that omega belongs to a k because a k is a partition. So omega has to belong to some a k. So this means that H of omega it's equal to H of k. And since uh, H of k belongs to b, this means that K belongs to this set M because this set M it's exactly the sets of indices for which HJ belongs to B. Therefore, since K belongs to M, this means that uh, omega belongs to this set because this set is the union of all J in M of AJ. And uh, since K is in M, and omega belongs to AK, omega belongs to this set. 
So uh, let me repeat this inclusion. So I have to take omega in this set and prove that it belongs to this set. So let me take a fix an omega in omega. Since uh, omega is the made of this partition, this means that omega has to belong to some k. So there exists a k for which omega belongs to a k. So fix that k. Well, but I know that h of omega belongs to b because omega belongs also to this set. So omega belongs to h of k, but also h of omega belongs to b. But since omega belongs to h k, this means that h of omega is equal to h k. This is the definition of h k. And h of omega belongs to b. So this means that h of k belongs to b. Since h of k belongs to b, this means that k belongs to m. So this is what I wrote here. And therefore, this means that omega belongs to this set because this set is the union of all j's, of all aj's for j in m. But since k belongs to m, ak is here, and therefore omega belongs to ak. So this proves that um, my first claim that indeed, if h is constant in all aj, then it's g measurable. So now uh, let's prove the other implication, I'm taking h g measurable, and I want to show that h is constant on h set aj. So h is a function which is g measurable. So this implies that h minus 1 of b belongs to g for all b Borwell. Now I want to define a special set, p0 which is a subset of R, and it's the set of all x such that uh, h of omega is equal to some x. So there exists omega such that h of omega is equal to x. So this is, well, the set, the image of H. So I'm calling uh, B0 the set of image of H. This is a subset of R. I'm not claiming that it's measurable, but what I will prove is that B0 is countable. And by showing that B0 is countable, it is, of course, uh, measurable. So let me assume that X belongs to uh, B0. So this means that H, so there exists A omega such that H of omega belongs to um, H of omega, it's equal to X. So this means that um, the inverse image of x, it's different from the empty set, right? So I'm, I'm taking B0 as the image, so take a point in the image. This means that uh, the inverse image is not empty, but also x, well, the set from the singleton set x, it's Borel measurable. This means that this element is an element of the sigma algebra G because h is measurable. And we have seen that the elements of uh, G are unions. So this tells me that H minus 1 of X is actually equal to a union. So there exists a set MX indexed by this X such that uh, this set is the union of MX of AJ. So mx is a subset of n, so mx will be uh, a set g1, g2, and so on. Let's say that these are formed in an increasing order, and it's clear that if I take a y different from x, the inverse image of y will be different, so that means that the set my will be have intersection empty with mx. So these sets, 
So here I just defined for each element x in B0, I defined a subset of n, which I called mx, which is the index such that the inverse image is equal to this union. And clear that if I take two different points, y and x in B0, then the set mx has no intersection with the set my, because these sets, um, well, if they had the intersection, that would mean that uh, a point will be, h of a point will be at the same time x and same time y, which is impossible. So this mx, this family mx, gives me a partition of n, and therefore uh, the map which associates to x, say, the smallest um, element of mx is one-to-one, -one, and since the image is countable, this tells me that the set B0 is countable because there's a one-to-one -one map between a countable set and B0. So that means that uh, B0 is countable. So the first, this proves my first claim. B0 is countable, and therefore this shows that uh, B0, I also know that B0 it's a Borel measurable set. Now, um, what I claim is that H of omega, it's equal, so remember the definition of mx. mx is uh, such that H inverse image of x, it's equal to the union for j in mx of aj. B0 is the image of uh, h, so I can rewrite as a sum of x in B0 of h of x, and here the indicator of the inverse image of x. B0, it's the image of H. B0, it's a countable set. So H is actually equal to HX in the inverse image of X by H. But the inverse image is this set. So this is the sum for X in B0 of HX, the indicator function of the union of G in MX of AJ. And therefore, this proves that indeed H is constant on each set AJ. Well, because here we have a formula. On this union, H is constant and equal to HX. And so we have uh, here a partition of omega, and on each of these sets of this partition, h takes a constant value, and this um, partition is made of unions of sets aj. So in particular, h is constant on each set aj, and that proves, therefore, my claim that h is g-measurable if and only if h is constant on each set aj. So now, uh, so I define this sigma algebra, and I wrote here uh, the two claims. Uh, we, one I left as an exercise, and the other I proved. Now let me consider a function f defined in omega, which is f measurable and integrable. I didn't say it, but I think it's obvious, so that g is a smaller sigma algebra than f, so the sigma algebra g is contained in f, and indeed any element of g can be written in this form, and well, these elements are, of course, f measurable. So g is a smaller sigma algebra than f, and I'm taking a function f, which is f measurable, so measurable with respect to uh, the original sigma algebra, and I'm assuming that it's integral so that the absolute value of f dp is finite. And I will define the conditional expectation of f given the sigma algebra g. 
So that will be a new function from omega to r. And uh, what's the definition of this conditional expectation? Well, on the set aj, so if, so this is a function, it depends, uh, it takes a different value for each omega. And if omega belongs to aj, this conditional expectation at this value omega will be equal to the conditional expectation of f given aj. And this I already defined. So I already defined the conditional expectation of f given aj uh, at the beginning of this lecture. So that was, remember, the uh, integral of f multiplied by the indicator of aj divided by the probability of aj. So here now I'm defining, so that's a real number, while here it's a function. So I'm defining that this function takes this value on the set aj. So another way in putting that is that the conditional expectation of f given this sigma algebra j, it's equal, well aj forms a partition, so let me consider this partition. On the set aj, this function takes a value which is the conditional expectation of f given aj. So this is uh, the definition of this conditional expectation. And uh, my point is two. First, I want to show that this conditional expectation, f given g, well, it's g measurable. So this is my first claim. And well, this first claim, it's obvious from the property I proved because, well, indeed, this function, it's constant on each set aj. On the set aj, it takes this value, so it, it's indeed constant. And since this function is constant on each set aj, we have seen it is g measurable. Now, my uh, second claim is that, well, let me take a function h, which is bounded, and so h is g measurable and bounded. Since h is bounded, f times h is integrable. So I can make sense to talk about the integral of f with respect to h dp. So this is well defined because h is bounded and f is integral. So my second claim is that this is equal to the, now I'll take the conditional expectation, this function, and I'll multiply that by h dp. So uh, in order to make sense of this, I have to guarantee that um, this object here is integrable, and then I have to prove that this identity holds. So uh, keep in mind this formula, because uh, I will erase it in order to have some space in order to prove this identity, and the fact that uh, this object here is integrable. So actually, I rewrote here um, the definition of the conditional expectation, and here um, the definition of the conditional expectation given a set aj. And here the claim, which I now I wish to prove, h, it's a g measurable, it's bounded, I claim that this identity holds. So the first claim which I need to prove is that this function is integrable, so that the expectation of f given g, that this, if I take the absolute value and I integrate that with respect to p, that this is finite. So um, let's prove that. 
So we have an integral, and here I will just replace the, uh, this function by its definition. So this is the absolute value of exponential f even aj on the set chi aj dp. Now uh, I have a sum, the absolute value, so this is bounded by the sum of the absolute values. So this is a real number, and this is a function, and this is a non-negative function, so this is e. Co the absolute value is actually equal to the absolute value of this quantity times chi ag dp. Now all these objects are positive, so I can exchange the sum with the integral by using Tonelli. So this is equal to the sum. Now, um, once I have the integral here, well, this is a real number, so it goes out from the integral, and it remains the integral of uh, the indicated function of aj, integrated with respect to p, but this is the probability of aj. Now, let's recall what's the definition of this conditional expectation. So this is equal to the sum of, well, let me replace this conditional expectation by uh, its value. So this is aj f dp divided by p aj times p aj. And this is equal, well, you see that PAJ will cancel with PAJ. So this is the sum of the absolute value of the integral of AJ. So let me rewrite that maybe as F times chi AJ dp. And let's use again that the absolute value of the integral, it's bounded by the integral of the absolute value. And when I um, take here the absolute value of this product, this is the absolute value of f chi. It's always already uh, positive, dp. Now we can use Tonelli again to put the sum inside the integral. And once you put the sum, you remember that aj forms a partition, so the sum of this indicator function is the indicator function of omega, and this is one, so this is equal to f dp, which is finite. So indeed, um, this function here, it's integrable, and therefore I'm allowed, uh, well, this one, it's also integrable because h I assume to be a bounded function. So this uh, expression makes sense, and now I wish to prove that we have this identity. So now we want to prove this identity. And um, so I don't remember. But I think this is step two, or maybe three. And I will divide that in two steps. I will first consider the function h. h will be the indicator of a set b, where b belongs to g. And then I'll consider uh, the general case. So let's assume for the moment that h is the indicator of a set b in g. And let's prove uh, this identity. So I will consider the right-hand side. So the right-hand side. I'll first observe that since B it's, uh, belongs to G, so it's the union. So this is equal to the sum. Well, what I'm using here is that chi B is equal to the chi of the union for J in M of AJ. So there exists a subset of N the non-positive integers uh, such that B is this union. And this I can write as the sum for J in M of chi AJ. So I'm using that directly here. So this is the sum for J in M of the indicator of AJ times the conditional expectation of F given g. 
uh, this function, it's integrable. This one is bounded by one. So um, we can use, and well, these are all sets with no intersection. So this object here is uniformly bounded by an integrable function. So I can use the dominated convergence theorem to uh, exchange the sum with the integral. And now, well, I know that on the set AJ, on the set AJ, this conditional expectation it's actually given by that one. So this is on the set AJ, this is the expectation of F given AJ. Right, so I first uh, exchange sum with integral and once I have only the integral, this is the indicator, so I'm integrating over the set AJ, but on the set AJ, this conditional expectation, it's actually given by uh, this number. So this is equal. Now, <clears throat> well, let's recall the definition of this expectation. This is, this is now a number, so it gets out from the integral, and what remains is the probability of AJ. And um, so what is this number? This number is this expression. This, so this is AJ, F dP divided by P of AJ. So this is this number, and this is multiplied by the probability of AJ. So the probability of AJ cancels with the probability of AJ, and what remains is the sum. So this is equal to the sum for j in m of the integral over ij of f dp. But this is, again, I can put, well, I can write that as the indicator of aj. I can exchange again, because f is integrable, the sum with the integral. And once I do that, what I get is that the sum of the indicators is the indicator of the union. And the union, it's um, the union of AJ, it's B. So this is the integral over B of F dP. And uh, this is exactly what we want to prove. So what um, we proved is that this expression, when H is equal to chi B, so that this expression, it's equal to this one, which is exactly the left-hand side here in the case in which H is the indicator of B. So we proved uh, this identity whenever H is the indicator of a set B in G. Now I will extend that to uh, any bounded function H, which is G measurable. Now, uh, 3B, let's finally prove this um, identity. So let me took, take a function H which is bounded and G measurable. Since it's G measurable, this means that it's constant over all AJ. So H is actually equal to, let me represent by HJ, the value of H on the set AJ. And let's recall that H is bounded so that these values HJ, these constants, are all are uniformly bounded by a constant C0. So this is the expression of H. And let's start again from the right-hand side. So H multiplying the conditional expectation of F given G dP. So this is equal because H is given by uh, this sum to the sum. Now, we can, again, argue that the HJ are uniformly bounded, that uh, these sets are disjoint, so, and that this uh, conditional expectation is integrable to replace, to use the dominated convergence theorem to, in order to replace integral with the sum. So this is equal to the sum 
of the integral of h a, but h a is a constant, so let's remove it. And here what we have is that chi a j, the expectation, the conditional expectation of f given g dp. But now uh, we already proved that when h is the indicator of a set in g, that this integral is equal to this one. So by the previous step, this is equal to the integral from the sum of h j. The indicator of the set aj times f dp. And at this point, uh, we can place back the constant hd inside the integral, place the sum, and recall that this is the definition of h f dp. So indeed, uh, we proved this uh, identity for all bounded functions uh, which are, which are uh, g measurable. So in order to justify the definition I will present in the next take, let me summarize what we did so far. So we are considering a probability space omega fp. And on this probability space, I'm considering a partition an of the set omega. So this means that omega is equal to the union of these sets an, and that these sets an are the joint which means that AI intersection AJ is equal to the empty set if I is different from J. Besides, I'm assuming that this is a measurable partition, which means that AN belongs to F for all N. And I'm also assuming that the probability of these sets is always strictly positive. Then we define the sigma algebra G, which is the sigma algebra generated by these sets a n. This means that g is the smallest sigma algebra which makes all these sets a n measurable. And once we did that, well, then we defined first what is the probability, the conditional probability of a set b given a n. And uh, more precisely, we defined what is the conditional expectation of a function f, f measurable and integrable with respect to a n. So let's consider a function f, which is integrable and measurable. So f is measurable with respect to f, and let's assume that it is integrable. And we defined the conditional expectation of f given the set a n as the integral over a n of f divided by the probability of a n. So this is well defined because we assumed that the probability are all positive. Once we did that, we extended this definition to the conditional expectation of f given the sigma algebra. So here there is a big difference because while this conditional expectation with respect to a set is a real number, now the conditional expectation given that sigma algebra, it's a function. So this is a function from omega to r. And what did we prove about this conditional expectation? Well, we defined it. So let's remember the explicit formula for this conditional expectation. It is given by the sum for all n larger than 1 of the conditional expectation of f given a n, and this is on the set a n. So chi a n is the characteristic function of the set a n, and therefore this is a function, and this function on the set a n takes this uh, real number, this value. So this is uh, how we defined this conditional expectation, and what did we prove? Well, we proved three properties about this conditional expectation. The first one is that this function, which goes from omega to r, is g measurable. So the conditional expectation of f given g is g measurable. Then we prove the second property. We prove that for all b in g, 
the integral over b of this function it's equal to the integral over b of f. So this holds for all b. So this is a second property of uh, this function which we defined. And finally, the third property is that if I take a function h from omega to r, which is bounded, and g measurable, then we have that the integral of h multiplying the conditional expectation of f given g, dp, this is equal to the integral of h f dp. So this is uh, what we proved. And um, well, based on these facts, we will define the conditional expectation of an integrable function f with respect to a sigma algebra g, general sigma algebra, in uh, the next take. So it's based on this, um, this example in which we will define now this condition expectation, but now replacing a sigma algebra g, which is generated by a countable uh, number of sets, by a general sigma algebra. And this is, um, well, the main topic of this lecture. So in view of what uh, we presented, we will define the conditional expectation. So recall we have a probability space, and we have a function f, which is f measurable and also integrable. And we will define the conditional expectation of f given g, where g is a sigma algebra contained in f. So it's a sub-sigma algebra of f. So I would say that a function um, f is the conditional expectation of f given g if it satisfies two conditions. The first one, I will require f to be g measurable. And then I will require that for all b in g, so for all subsets b of omega which are g measurable, we have the following identity. b of the function f dp, it's equal to b f dp. So I'll say that a function f is the exp um, conditional expectation of f given g if it is measurable and if it satisfies this identity for all a set b in g. And uh, we will prove in the next take that such a function exists and is uniquely defined. So theorem we have uh, this probability space, we have g a sub sigma algebra of f and what this theorem tells us is that there exists a unique uh, and I will explain what I mean by uniqueness here a unique conditional expectation of f even g. And so proof, we have uh, to prove the existence. So I'll start with the existence. And for that, we will use the Radon-Nicodym theorem. So uh, we will consider the measure space omega and the sigma algebra g, which is defined on subsets of omega. And in this space, we have one measure, p. p is defined in f, but g is contained in f. Therefore, p of a is well defined for all a in g. So this is a measure. And now we'll define a second measure, q. So q is defined in this measure space. And q of a will be given by the integral of a f dp. 
So this is well defined because f is integrable, and this defines, I leave it to you to check, a measure. So q is a probability measure on this space. So that's easy to show. So my first, my second claim is that q is absolutely continuous with respect to p. So recall from measure theory what absolutely continuity means. It means that if I have a set A, so mind that uh, Q is defined on G. So <clears throat> what is absolutely continuous? Take a set A in G, assume that P of A is equal to zero. We have to show that Q of A is equal to zero. But that's clear because if the measure of A is zero with respect to p, then the integral of f on a is also zero, which means that q of a is zero. So indeed, q is absolutely continuous with respect to p. And now we <coughs> uh, rely on the radon nicodym theorem, which tells us that, well, if we have a measure q which is absolutely continuous with respect to a measure p, then there exists a g measurable function h, so h we're working in this space, so uh, h is measurable, which means measurable with respect to that sigma field. h is g measurable, such that q of a is equal to the integral of a dp on the set a. And uh, remember that h in the radon nicodym derivative, it's usually represented by dq dp. So the uh, radon nicodym theorem, which um, I'll give you reference in the notes, but you can find in any book on measure theory, um, guarantees the existence of these g measurable functions such that q of a is equal to the integral of h on the set a with respect to p. Well, and I claim that this a, it's exactly our, so my claim is that a, it's exactly our, our conditional expectation, which means that it satisfies the two conditions which uh, define the conditional expectation. So remember, the first condition was that H, the conditional expectation, is uh, G measurable, and that's indeed the case. H is indeed G measurable. Now, the second condition, remember, requires that if I take any set B, which is G measurable, the integral with respect of H on the set B, it's equal to the integral of F on the set B with respect to P. And I, would, I claim that this identity is true. And so let's prove it here. So B H D P, it's equal, well, by uh, this identity, which um, defines h, it's, that's equal to q of a. Right? This is uh, the property of h given by the radon nicodym theorem. And on the other hand, by definition of q, this is equal q of a. It's equal to the integral of f on the set b. So indeed, we have uh, this identity. So the second property is satisfied. And therefore, uh, this proves that H fulfills the two conditions which defines the conditional expectation. Therefore, H is a conditional expectation which completes the proof of the existence. So now let's turn to the proof of uniqueness. So let's assume that there exists two. Uh, H1 and H2, which are equal to uh, satisfy, so are equal to the conditional expectation, which means that I'm assuming that H1 and H2 satisfy the two conditions which define the conditional expectation. This means that H1 and H2 are uh, G measurable. This is the first property. And then the second property tells us that for all b in uh, g, we have that the integral of b of h1 dp, this is equal to the integral over b of f dp. 
And since H2 is also a conditional expectation, it satisfies also this identity. So what we conclude for these uh, two identities is that for all B in G, we have that the integral of H1 over B, it's equal to the integral of H2 over B. And from that, I claim, and I leave it to you as an exercise, H1 is equal to H2 almost surely. Right, well, um, this is a very simple exercise. If we have uh, two functions such that the integral of H1 with on over the set B is equal to H2 over the set B, and for all B measurable, then they are equal almost surely. And this is uh, the uniqueness sense of the conditional expectation, is that, well, the conditional expectation, it's unique up to sets of measure zero. So if we have two functions which satisfies the two properties of the conditional expectation, then they are equal almost surely. So let me complete uh, this lecture with uh, some properties or remarks about the conditional expectation. So the first one, is that the conditional expectation is integrable. So that this is integrable. Right? Remember that we started from the assumption that f is integrable, but now I claim that the conditional expectation is also integrable. And uh, so to prove that, let's recall that we have that This identity holds for all sets B in G. So let me take the set B, the set on which of all omegas such that the conditional expectation is larger than zero. Well, since this function is G measurable, the point at which it is uh, non-negative, it's also an element of G. And so what we get from this is that on this set, B, we have the identity. Well, since the set B is G measurable, this identity holds, so let me maybe call that set B plus, since um, B plus belongs to G, this identity holds for B plus. So let me write it as B plus. And um, in particular, what we have is that note that this function, this function multiplied by the on the set B plus, it's non-negative. So this integral is non-negative, and on the other hand, this object here, it's bounded by the integral of the modulus of f dp, which is finite. So uh, this is telling us what's appearing here is that the indicator of the set, what is b plus, so this is, I can rewrite that as the indicator times dp, but b plus is the set at which this function is uh, non-negative, and therefore this product here is exactly equal to the positive part of the function ef, the conditional expectation. So let me represent by the, this symbol the non-negative part of the function of the conditional expectation. So remember that if we have a function h, we represent by h plus the non-negative part. So this is, if we have a function h, we represent by a plus h plus the non-negative part of h. So h plus of a point omega, it's equal to h of omega if h of omega is less or equal, greater or equal than zero, and it's zero otherwise. 
So it's, uh, this function is positive and coincides with h if h is positive. And this is exactly what appeared here. So what we proved is that the integral of the positive part of the conditional expectation is bounded by the absolute value, the integral of the absolute value of p, which is finite. And this proves, therefore, that the positive part of the conditional expectation um, has finite integral, therefore it's integrable. The same argument will show that the negative part, and since the absolute value is given by the positive part plus the negative part, we conclude from this inequality and from the same inequality with the plus replaced by the minus that the conditional expectation is indeed integrable. And this is our first property, our first remark. Let me call that P0. So P0, we just proved that uh, the conditional expectation is integrable. Then uh, let me give you a second property, is that, well, assume that f is g measurable. Okay, so we recall that we are working with a space omega fp, and we have an integrable function f, which is measurable by f. But now I'm assuming that f is also um, measurable with respect to the smaller sigma field g. Then what I claim is that the conditional expectation of f given g, it's equal to f. And whenever you want to prove that some function is equal to the conditional expectation, you have to show that this function has the two properties of the, which defines the conditional expectation. So we have to show that this function is, which is f, is g measurable, but this is by assumption. And then we have to prove that this function has the following property, that f dp is equal to b f dp for all b in g. But this is a tautology, and so indeed f fulfills the two properties which define the conditional expectation, and therefore it's equal to the conditional expectation. And remember, when I say here that it's equal, I always mean that it's equal almost surely. So that proves uh, this is the second property. Then uh, let me conclude with one remark and one, uh, two notations. If you take a function f, and now I'm assuming that it is only uh, f measurable, I can always write f as f minus the expectation of f given the conditional expectation of f given g plus the conditional expectation of f given g. This uh, second piece, uh, it's a g measurable. While the first piece, I claim it's orthogonal to g. And what do I mean by orthogonality? I mean that it is a function so I'll say that g is orthogonal to g, that h, sorry, it's orthogonal to g, if the following condition holds, if the expectation or the integral of h, um, let me call p, or maybe p, it's not well chosen, uh, j dp, it's equal to 0 for all g which are j which are g measurable and bounded. So I'll say that h is orthogonal to uh, the sigma field g if this identity holds for all functions j which are g measurable and bounded just to make sure um, that this integral is well defined. And what I claim is that this function and so let me call this function the function uh, maybe capital F. So I claim that capital F indeed belongs to uh, the, uh, which is orthogonal to G. So we have to check that this identity holds. And what we know is that if I take uh, any set B in G, 
what I have is that f minus the conditional expectation of f given g dp that this is equal to zero by definition of the conditional expectation. And this integral, I can write it as the integral of the uh, indicator function of the set B times this function capital F. So I know that this is equal to zero. So that tells me that this property holds. But well, for functions which are the indicator functions of sets. So I want to extend this identity to all bounded measurable functions. And that's, uh, well, we know how to do that. We proved that it holds for characteristic functions. So now by linearity, we extend that to simple functions, which are G measurable. And then we know that we can approximate any uh, bounded G measurable function by a sequence of simple functions which converge uniformly, which converge pointwisely, but which are uniformly bounded uh, by the norm of G. So we know that we can find a sequence Jn of simple functions which converge pointwisely to the function J and such that the bound, the L infinity bound of Jn it's bounded by the L infinity bound of J, which is finite. And therefore, we can extend uh, this identity for simple functions to bounded functions by using the dominated convergence theorem. So indeed, um, this function here, it's orthogonal to G. And therefore, here, we have a decomposition of a function into the sum of two functions. The first one is G measurable, and the third, second one it's orthogonal to uh, the sigma algebra G in this sense. So this is uh, just a remark. And now uh, two notations. Notation one is that, well, assume that I have a set A which is measurable with respect to F. So I will represent by P A the conditional probability of A given the sigma algebra G. And this is just a way, simple way, to represent the conditional expectation of the indicator function of A given G. So instead of writing this conditional expectation, I will write it as this conditional uh, probability. And then the second notation is that, well, remember that we represent by sigma x the uh, sigma algebra generated by x. This means that the smallest sigma algebra, which makes a random variable x to be measurable. And so we could write the conditional expectation of f given that sigma algebra, sigma x. But instead of writing that, I will write it by the following in the following way, the expectation of f given the random variable x. So if I have a random variable x, or if I have a random vector x1, xn, I represent by uh, this symbol, expect the conditional expectation of f given x. What I really mean is that this is the conditional expectation of f given the sigma algebra generated by x. That means the sigma algebra, the smallest sigma algebra, which makes x measurable. In the same way, by uh, this symbol, I mean the conditional expectation of f, given the smallest sigma algebra, which makes x1, x2, xn measurable, which means the sigma algebra generated by x1, x2, xn. So we will use um, many, many times these uh, two notations. <coughs> 